This is a production of Cornell University. Please join me in welcoming Sarah and Kanza. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I'll speak a little bit also and greet you. When I say Sanbonan, you must say Yebo. Sanbonan. Yebo. Sanbonan. Yebo. Okay, I would continue and say Ninjani. And when I say Ninjani, what do you say, Kirby? <laughs> you say, you say Sikona. <laughs> Mm, I'll take this time to recognize uh, a number of people. Um, I'll begin with David Gaspari. He's the present chairperson of Ithaca Cities of Asylum. And all of your friends. I see some Southern Africans here. So it's good. Maybe my English will be different from the English you just heard. I'd like to engage you in a little bit of Southern Africanness. It's kind of flat for me to begin reading. Okay. When I went back to Swaziland, I was going back to a country that I was familiar with and a country that I love. And it's kind of sad to hear it described as you have just heard. You know, and you live in, in, and you wake up and the sun shines and you look at the people and you still ch see children and chickens walking in the yard. You, you feel things are normal. But after studying at Michigan State for the PhD and making plans in my mind that I was going to do this and do that and so on and so forth, I went back to Switzerland and the place that I found 1996 was very different. It was a very, very different place. It was different to go to, to class and teach students and know that when the commencement is read, in their space, there will be the word posthumously. It was said to look at the commencement pages and see about eight names with that word so-and-so posthumously, so-and-so posthumously. So I had to change, change the way I look at the world and ask myself what else, uh, what, what could be done? Because among the things you couldn't do was to talk openly about things. People were not talking openly about things. Um, the type of person who's very impulsive, if I see something, I ask. If I say, if people say, so-and-so is sick, my response would be to say, what's wrong with him? <laughs> and when people see that, they, they just look at me, and everybody goes, <sighs> it's like you've deflated a balloon. And then I had to learn in time that I have to speak differently. If you hear that someone is sick, you have to do something else, you know, just give yourself time and give everybody time and maybe someone whom you trust in a private place you can talk about why people are sick. But that was very sad. I felt very sad when my friends, when we live on the campus in Switzerland, we are friends. People go to Australia, they go to this and that place. And when you don't see them, you assume that people have gone to school. But when they the ambulance came for someone next door to me whom I played tennis with and always thought he would go and play tennis when he comes back from Australia and the person wasn't in Australia, that person was in their room and nobody would tell me that they were very, very sick. I felt hurt. So it is under those conditions, just generally, the situation with HIV AIDS was very devastating for me. And then just going to the countryside and finding the same, same sort of similar situations. And then looking at the whole situation in Swaziland and feeling that we were not doing much. We were still, you know, doing the same things. 
you know, happy, you know, um, to give you a, an impression of what Swaziland is like. I will, am I supposed to move from here? <laughs> okay, I will demonstrate, I'll ask you to do something for me. Okay, you are going to say the words ingwe when I lift up my hands. My hand, I'll lift up this one. You are going to sing. If you can't sing, just say ingwe. Can you say ingwe? ingwe. Yes, ingwe. ingwe. Okay, I'll give you the tune. You are saying ingwe. Ingwe. So you say Ingwe, can you say that? Ingwe, loud. Ingwe, ingwe. So that's what you are saying. I will do the, the singing. Normally, song in Southern Africa, you have a lead and you have the backing. You guys are going to be my backing. So I'll begin. When I raise my head, I'll sing with you a little bit and then I'll go. Yatla sela ingwe, yatla sela ingwe, no boya benya mazani. Yatla sela ingwe, yatla sela ingwe, eh, no boya benya mazani. Seba ka bengani ngwe, seba ka bengani ngwe, eh, no boya benya mazani. Yatla sela ingwe, yatla sela ingwe, eh, no boya benya maza. Se baka bengani ngwe, se baka bengani ngwe, eh, no boya benya maza. Yatla sela ingwe, yatla sela ingwe, eh, no boya benya maza. Seba ka bengani ngwe, seba ka bengani ngwe, eh no boya benya mazani. Yatla sela ingwe, yatla sela ingwe, eh no boya benya mazani. Seba ka bengani ngwe, seba ka bengani ngwe, eh no boya benya mazani. Okay, then. I'm not... Okay. I'm not a soprano, so I cannot sing. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine then a culture where people, people have this aura of togetherness. They have these metaphors. If you are singing Yatla Sela Ingwe, you are saying it has attacked. It has attacked the leopard that has the as the hair, you know, like fleece off a back. So they are saying it has attacked. It has attacked the leopard that has the fleece off a back. And they get into this, you see, where you can't even see people, where you don't even care, where the spirit is one. If you look at the power of the Swazi people, and look at the metaphor and ask yourself exactly what is the leopard that has attacked the Swazi people? I won't answer that question. The only thing I would like to say is that when you have been taught to engage society in its own problems, you ask yourself, what is it that I can say to answer the question, what is the leopard that has attacked the Swazi people? What was the leopard that was attacking the Swazi people? What will be the leopard that is attacking the Swazi people? It's not a question that I can answer, but sometimes you ask yourself, what could I do to make the people ask the question themselves because it means we are either as a people building a life together, building a culture, we are not asking the right questions if we cannot answer the question, what exactly is happening to us? 
So it is under those conditions that I started to ask myself if, if literature could answer that question for the Swazi people, if they could engage together in text and start to look at the situation that they are in differently. I don't think that I succeeded. I think what I'll do is I'll read and you can assess for yourself, but you will sort of have an idea where I come from. If you have had the chance to view yourself in a small country that's 180 by 120 miles. I think from, from here to New York is more than that. And things are just going the way um, other people will describe, which I cannot really spend time describing. So I'll begin the, reading to you this one poem. I like to write word poems, but I was hoping that if you go to people and you talk about words, they would start to question the words that they use. Okay, words. Tears swallowed, fill the stomach. Thoughts unspoken make the head hang down. Words creeping everywhere with no feet to carry them. Sound empty and ownerless. They speak what nobody hears and see what nobody sees. They creep in the dark like cockroaches. They lurk in the mind like lies hiding in a dirty head. I scratch my head. You scratch your head. Words fall down one after another. Yes, we have our words. They stand and look at us in the eye. I'll read another poem. It's entitled, Yesterday You Said. Yesterday you said till supper time. Today you say till medicine time. Yesterday you said till I get back. Today you say, till you set your eyes on me. For I stand up and walk like I used to, then fall down and remember I am sick. Yesterday we sang, I loved your voice. We laughed and hoped. Now we sing near my bed. Come, my friends, come. Sing to me. Buy me food. Papaya, for it is soft and smooth as it goes down my throat. I will read this one. It says, Story of a Grandmother. The woman stands. In the heat, she stands. In the rain, she stands. In the fields, she stands. In the kitchen, she stands. When others have gone, she stands. Staring the pot, looking at the fire, sweat on her brow on this hot Sunday. She has to feed her grandchildren. Mama is gone, where all of them go, to the land of the sick, where death calls and nobody returns. Her grandchildren are crying. They cannot eat death. Even though they were born with it looking at them like a shortness in the dark. The infant stares on her back, squirming as she bends, thinking, if only I could be young and have milk in my breast to feed this little one. Who will tell the stories if she dies before they grow? She will have to tell half a story and leave the details to time. The wind will blow. It will whistle words through the grapevine that you will hear them. This one is all, all things considered. All things considered, I was Swazi. Once they called me colored, but I was as black as anybody. 
All things considered, I was female. But when they wanted firewood chopped, I climbed up a tree and chopped off branches. All things considered, I was lazy. But I washed clothes and dishes all day. I carried water in a bucket with a baby on my back. All things considered, I was untidy. But I straightened out cupboards, dusted chairs and floors till they shone. All things considered, I was a housemaid. But I cooked all day and fed everybody. I planted flowers in the garden and weeded. All things considered, I was hired. But I worked for nine months without pay and had to accept a post-dated check from my boss. All things considered, I was homeless. But I built a home and had to leave it. It could not have been mine. All things considered, I was fatherless, but I did not leave the space where the form said, Father, blank. I filled it up with the word deceased because it sounded good. All things considered, I was married, but I spent more lonely nights than a stone in the veld, for I married the wind that blows in all directions. All things considered, I was alive, but I died each day when I poured out my spirit because I saw others dying as if they were not me. This one is entitled, This Country Spills Death. This country speaks, excuse me, this country springs out at me. It holds me by the throat, squeezes breath out of me wraps fear into my body and throws me into a heap. Convulsions, confusion, creases of nerves, tangled words, crying out of me for words I all I have. Yet some still laugh, sing and dance, and marry many, many wives. See, see what I see for this country lies on one side, one side sinks into the abyss of death, hunger, dispossession, silence, helplessness, hopelessness in the eyes of many, living yet dying in the hunger of our words. Yet some still laugh, sing and dance, and marry many, many wives. Who can speak when words are dear? This country chokes words. They come out in tatters torn and thrown in heaps in a forest where nobody goes. Yet some still laugh, sing and dance, and marry many, many wives. I like words, I like their sound, yet I cannot speak them when they are shredded by the scissors that cut deep into the souls of those whose lives are about to end. Yet some still laugh, sing and dance, and marry many, many wives. The country bleeds. Look at its sunken eyes, crying, what, where? So long a lament, so loud a wail, yet it goes unheard. This country bleeds to death, so small, so insignificant to the world. This country wails, but nobody hears. Words are taken by the storm that thunders all over it, yet yesterday, just yesterday was independence, today it is dependence, today it is death. It clothes at us, tears us into nothing, the nothing of us is gone. It speaks in words from seedless youth, born sick and unable, lying unfed even when fed, walking slowly clothed in death, for tomorrow promises nothing but blank horizons, deadly sunsets and cold mornings that well up in the eyes of headsmen, clansmen, and countrymen. Yet some still laugh, sing, and dance, and marry many, many wives. I look at the far, far horizon at the silent country and death, real death speaks back at me. It hits me on the back, I bend over double when I see women weeding but dead, women walking but dead. Woman to woman, your birth, 
my birth, your womb, my womb is nothing but death, while some still marry many, many wives and buy many, many cars and build many, many houses in a future marked by a silent walking ghost whose name is as dead as death itself. This poem is entitled, Hear Me. I enter a woman forbidden, a woman uncultured. My behave hairstyle is me, my body uncovered is me. I swing inside my skirt in this house of the learned. Mr. Speaker, hear me. I speak the words of the hungry. I speak the words of those for whom school was just a building, painted and different from the heart, with men and women who knew words that could talk. I never learned to put words on paper and make them speak. Look at them in the whiteness. I saw snakes. Mr. Speaker, listen to me. My words are hot. My belly is empty. It is chewing me. My words have to get to you. You are running the place of words. I have come, a woman unsure, how to speak when I'm given. They stick, the, they stick to say, it is my turn. I talk under the tree. The talk under the tree is a talk unheeded. I have left the arena. I have come here. I hold the thing that makes words loud. Mr. Speaker, remember me. I gave birth to one like you. I can stand before crowds. I can speak. This poem is entitled Market, Market Day Slow Down. She sold, pegged, counted into plastic bags, tomatoes, potatoes, onions, oranges, beetroot, and guavas, mangoes, sweet and overripe, tomatoes, juicy from Miss Henry. Then straining to walk, twisting her body, one ache here, one ache there, yet she still goes. One plastic bag here, one plastic bag there. The end comes with one loud fall. She sits, unable to lift herself. No food, no drink. Then the body shuts down. Then the hospital. Then the end. People ask. She cannot talk. Then she goes. The end of a market woman is a hard, quiet end. This one is entitled Questions of the Refugee. Did you write about how the bullets fired in the night whistling above the voices? Did you write about hearing the cries of children, the stampede of people running, the cries of the wounded falling in the pregnant darkness of the night? Did you write about sleeping under trees, running from soldiers, panting with breath? Did you write about begging in faraway lands, fearing your own thoughts? This poem is about Ithaca. It says, it's about the waterfall. Waterfall, hear me. Waterfall, pour into me. Fall inside me in a rush, gushing, hushing sound from the sky, from bigger water. 
rush me down to the bottom of me, make my thoughts clean, wash me, rectify me, purify me, simplify me, speak to me of nature. When I stand here in the gorge, watching your ever-pouring self, let me merge with you. Let my hands rise and fill with you as I pour myself into the world. For you have taught me to give of myself like you give, as long as life is in you. Bless me, bless me, make me, make me like your fearless self, not intimidated by snow, rain, sunshine. Let me get full with poetry, for watching you makes me want to say words, for you are bigger than my words, and yes, bigger than my words. This poem is entitled Woman in the Tree. The murky flood waters climb higher. She climbs up the tree to reach a place of safety. Birth pains begin, she holds on. It's a moment of birth or a moment of death. She fights for two. The little life can't wait. It wants life where there is none. Silent death all around, but also the cries of a first life. The water rises even higher. She reaches down for the life that comes, ties the little one to herself, climbing higher and higher, panicking and hoping that this tree will not fall. The woman and her baby, two birds alive amidst the death all around. I'll read an example of the, um, the stuff that I wrote for the column where basically what we were doing, it was to write about the situation. It was um, after the evictions, what happened is that different people tried to demonstrate. The students always demonstrate and it's always a one-way street. They walk from the campus to the palace and the, you can see the palace of the king from where the university is. It's maybe something like three miles, but it's on a, on a mountain. So you always, we, 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 even when we were students, we used to do this marching to the palace to protest. So after they protested, the police threw tear gas on them. And then different groups of people protested. Women decided to protest. This is African protest. In, in Africa, the worst type of protest, protest by women. It's up, actually the, 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 how do you call this? It's supposed to be their protest is to go naked. It's, it's done, it's been done in Kenya, in Nigeria, you could go to different countries. So the women were fed up because nothing was being done about the people who had been evicted. So they decided that they would go naked. And then what happened was that they, they decided not to just go naked in the street. What happens is if, if the police attack people, women will come to the front and then take the clothes and put them up on their head. What normally happens is that the men run away. So <laughs> if, you read, if you read history, this, this type of protest stopped a war in the 1800s because the, the men didn't know the women were hiding. They, they just made the law and the, the war stopped. So the women in Swazi decided that they would go to the home of the prince to protest there. So what happened was that they, they, were, they said they would arrest them for public indecency. So when we were writing, we were actually defending them. We had to dig into the records. There had been a, a pro There was a man who, who just wanted to scare women and, and did this thing. And fortunately, they took a picture of him. So we had a number of things that we could put together. 
So uh, the piece that I'll read to you then is addressing that. It's entitled Meetings of the Bold and Resolute. Take my word for it, Swaziland is fast becoming a country of the politically conscious. If you had told me two years ago that women would bear their buttocks in public and, and organizations would cross borders to meet in foreign soil, I would have looked at you as if you were from Mars. I'm proud of the steps of our political that our political activists are taking. It means we are starting to appreciate the price of freedom. This is a time when we will stop at nothing to get our voices heard. After reading the women's resolution in last week's Swazi News, I thought we would see bones thrown down and lightning in the skies. I thought the Mgomazulus would do as they did to the Boers. I was ready to go to the grave of the Fanda Mavis and ask what was done by the clan of the king, the king that never was. Instead, I found myself focusing on the meetings of women and the declarations they made. They said, we do not have guns, tear gas, and chambers to fight, but what we have we will use until our voices are heard. These women who had taken to the forest to hold their meetings are the bravest Swazis I have ever come across. They are bold and resolute, and their demands are clear. One, they will not have the prince as the chief of the areas. Two, they abhor, they abhor a culture of lies saying the prince is the rightful chief of the area is a lie. They will continue to protest by bearing their buttocks till the chiefs are returned to the areas. They request the international community to call for a reinstatement of the evicted chiefs. Their demands are as follows, that reinstatement be treated as a matter of agency, that the police be removed from the areas, that the deaths of the two young women be investigated, that the prince be removed from the area. Whoever said a woman's place is in the kitchen, a woman's place is in the forefront of the struggle. I have not read such strong statements as the ones the women made. Their cause is my cause and the cause of every Swazi. As a woman, I am proud of the commitment to the struggle that the women have shown. I say with a loud voice, forward ever. I'd like to know how I'm doing for time. <laughs> so I can stop and maybe people can ask questions. Yes. Depends. If he has written a lot of protest literature, I feel when the time comes to go light, it's time to go light. You know, I don't think a, a, a writer should write in a certain way all the time. I feel genres should just be explored for what they can give people. Any other question? Yes. Yeah, has, you, has your work changed since you've been in Africa? That is, since you've been in, in, essentially an exile brother, <clears throat> although we're glad to hear that you're going back. But is there some difference that you find in your poetry or your fiction? Mm, a little bit. When you are not in Swaziland and stifled by the everyday happenings, the nostalgia for the country comes back and you write like, sometimes lightly. For example, I, I skipped a poem here that's about the hot springs in Swaziland, you know, because I remember that. Swaziland has a lot of hot kisses from the ground. So it's one of the things we enjoy. It's one of the things that I can't experience here. Yeah, I can't just go to the waterfall. It's not steaming hot. You know? <laughs> and yet in Sussex, you can go to a, a lot of places where you have those hot geysers and just dip yourself in hot, steaming water with people. 
Okay, <laughs> that means I must add. I was trying to close this book, but it's difficult as you can see. I don't mind. I have to look at it, look for it though. Because I skipped it and covered it with other things. Okay, first. Okay, it's entitled Hot Springs. It says, inside your hot blue water, my body sinks. Your natural beauty caressing the small of me. Bodies of women all around, like hippos basking. Big African women, big at the back, bigger still than me talking and laughing. There are hot springs sprinkled all over the countryside of blue skies and green forests. When I was little, I found a coin at the bottom of one. Any other question? Can we close? Yes. Started in writing. So that's a long story. I used to be a literature teacher. I was trained to teach English literature and language and geography. So I only taught geography for two weeks in my whole life. So I, was just, I just went to those schools where there were no English teachers. And then what would happen is most of the prescriptions for African novels were written by non -Swazis. If I had to teach, I had to teach Chinua Achebe, Cyprian Equency, and so on and so forth. And I always had to do a lot of research. And the question that I always had in my mind was, do my students really feel that language can be for them as well? You know, like a personal thing. So. I decided that one of the things that I would do would be to write so that my students can see themselves in the book. It's different for Africans to see Achibe's work in West Africa. That's way, way further. Talking about coconut and palm oil and all this. And there's none of that in Southern Africa. So I wanted to teach them about the veld, to talk to them about just the, the things that we have there, the flutes that they hear, the frogs, definitely the frogs, I think. When it rains, that's one thing. Oh, if there's anyone who's been to Southern Africa, they would laugh because after the rains, you have these frogs that are going, ho, oh, 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 oh. I mean, it's like you can't even sleep. But we, because we grew up with them, they're just the fun thing. I wanted them to read about that, to read about the things they are used to. Read about the, you know, just the things you see, the birds, you know, and the names that they, the sounds they give them. So I was lucky that when the government wanted, the government introduced Swazi before when I went to school in the 70s, we learned Zulu. So after independence, which means 68, 69, they decided that the language of Swaziland must be learned in the schools and there was no literature. So they would bring people to, to just make people interested in writing. And I was one of those and, you know, that got me started. And then afterwards I didn't stop. I decided that I would use this opportunity to write novels because they also needed young adult literature for the school. So I went into that. What language do you write in? Do you write in English or do you write? I write in both all the time. I write, in, I write in Swazi. Even now, I write in Swazi. I actually like writing in Swazi. It's an interesting language. Yes. It's different from, you know, the, these are the people who will know what I mean. You should ask those two, they'll tell you what I mean. It's more also somewhere there she is residing there. The Nguni language is. In the Bantu languages in Southern Africa are divided into Bantu, Sutu, and Bantu Ngunu, Zulu, Kosa, Swaz, and Debele, spoken in Zimbabwe and Pondo, I think. They, we understand each other. But the, the cultural idiom of Swazi 
is different from the idiom of Corsa, even though the, the philosophy and thought is the same. Swazi is sort of subtle and, you know, Swazis are never firm. Like you can hear me reading this, this stuff about the bold and the resolute. You never speak to Swazis like this. When you do that, they just think, oh, you know, you have to sort of speak in a certain way, you know, <laughs> because it's a land of kings, so everybody is a king. So somewhere, somewhere in that discourse, you are, you are trying to, to deal with the reader in a very different way. You know, you seduce Swazi readers differently from you would seduce closer readers, if you know what I mean. You get into their mind very differently. Yes. They are very separate, very separate. My children who are my readers, they always say my best work is in Swazi. I don't know. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Akwa. I'm from Ghana, and I moved here about uh, five years ago. And I'm trying to pursue English as a major, but you know, my parents are very traditional Africans, and they don't, I'm supposed to be you know, pretty bad, and I'm just wondering, are there any since coming from an African perspective, are there any tips I can tell them about how how much I love to write? You know, is there anything that you could say that I could use some direction? That's a tough one. <laughs> it's tough because I'm a parent. <laughs> so it's tough to, to speak for young people when you are on the other side and you are paying the money. <laughs> But I, I, I really don't know how to answer that question because if you if you're in Swazi, you just have you, you have no double up. We say you have no double up. <laughs> it's just tough luck, <laughs> except that you have to continue doing both. If I were in your boots, I would take as much literature. <laughs> Even if I'm in medicine, there's still a lot that you will. You can teach people using literature. But I don't think that it will be an easy thing to tell parents that you think that this is what you want to do. I know how, how African parents think. African parents who are professors. This is what they say. You see, if my children become teachers like me, I'll kill them. And then you go to the others who are nurses. So if my child ever becomes a nurse, I will disown her. <laughs> we hear all these things. Every parent doesn't want their child to be. And then you listen to the reasons why. The professors who are in the arts, some of them are very good, you know, good professors, good uh, actors and so on and so on. But there's no money in this. They are only doing it. In Africa, you can't be an actor and say, because you teach drama and you can do it, you will end up anywhere with money in your pocket. It's just something you do as a service. So they just complain that they spend so much of their time trying to be somebody, and they became very, very poor. So I, I understand where you come from. And I didn't want to be in, in, in the humanities. I didn't want to be in the humanities. It was just an accident. <laughs> yes, it was, because I pursued political science. And then somewhere after two years, I said, I just didn't want to leave Swaziland and go, because our university was in three countries. If you did political science, then you ended up in, a, in another country and not in Swaziland. So. When the time came to go to the other country to do my third year, I decided that I would rather opt for this evil, go to first year again and take the humanities. And that's what I did. When I was in second year, they were lenient and said, because I'm, I'm supposed to be in third year, I should take, I should double the years. When I'm in third year, I'm doing second year as well <laughs> until I finish. 
So it's a hard choice sometimes. Yes. Um, is it anything that you're working on right now that you can talk about? Yes. Mm -hmm. I tend to work on a number of things. I'm doing short stories and also doing a novel on the evictions. I think that's what I really want to finish, to write about the evictions because I feel so as the people were evicted and people just don't know what it's like to lose your home except people who have been evicted. But that type of eviction is worse because the police just come and take everything and put it on the truck and go throw you somewhere, you know. So that's what I'm working on. And poetry, you know, I just do. I dabble with everything at the same time. But also feeling that that um, the situation in Swaziland is so sad, I'm trying to find a different way to talk about it. I think it has made me sad for too long. I'm still looking at literature as a way to get me and the people of Swaziland out of that sadness. Thank you, if there are no more questions.